Luke 24, just some highlights in this chapter. This chapter is typically divided into four sections. There's the empty tomb in the first 12 verses we read. Then you have the two on the road to Emmaus. And then you have the disciples gathered together in a room and Jesus appears to them. And then you have his ascension. So under that title, the resurrection, I want these three headings under that title. First, the empty tomb. But secondly, which is unexpected, the hopeless road. And then thirdly, what's unexpected, the fearful room. Because John 20 tells us that they are assembled for fear and the door is locked for fear of the Jews. So an empty tomb and then unexpectedly, a hopeless road and then unexpectedly, a fearful room. What did Jesus say to give them hope? And what did He do and say to dispel their fears? So they became a band of crucified followers that took the gospel to the nations. So first, an empty tomb. As we read, we see the women show up at the grave site bringing spices to anoint the body of Jesus. He was not anointed. It was the preparation for the Passover. So they rushed Him to the grave to be there before the Sabbath started. So they come back early in the morning and He's not there. The two men are the two angels in shining garments, and they say in verse 6, He is not here. He is risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, Well, how do you know He's not there or wasn't there? Right? You didn't see it. Are we believing, as many would tell us today, some fabricated story, a lie that these 11 guys made up and somehow they were able to perpetuate almost 2,000 years? How do you know that? Two ways that these passages will tell us, two, two groups that we'll call it, uh, that will give witness to that. First, the human witness, the eyewitnesses, and then the witness of Scripture. First, the eyewitnesses, there are several that will tell us that the resurrection is an objective, observable, verifiable, historic reality. Objective, meaning it's not based on your feelings or opinions. You know, so many times Christianity is rejected on the basis of subjectivity. I don't, I don't like Christianity. I don't prefer Christianity. I'm, I'm not interested in it. You know, all the rules of the Bible and the things, they, the Bible tells you what you can say, what you can't say, what you have to think, what you don't think, even how you feel. Christianity is not for me. I don't like it. Well, the resurrection is objective. So set, a, set aside what you don't like about Christianity and let's talk about the objective reality. It has nothing to do with how you feel. It has nothing to do about your opinions. It has nothing to do with your interests, your preferences. It is an objective reality that was observed by many eyewitnesses. First, women. Now somebody may be asked, why were women the first ones to see that Jesus was raised? Well, because they got up early. I mean, they were the first ones there. The old idiom, you know, the early bird gets the worm. They got up early. Nobody else did. That's the first reason. But secondly, more importantly, is the witness of women in the ancient world. There is no plausible reason why the writers of Scripture would include women as eyewitnesses. They were considered almost possessions in that ancient world. They had a very low status. Jewish men wouldn't let them count money into their hands on the threat of touching their hands. Jewish rabbis would not teach women. The Talmud, which is the commentary on the Torah, or the five, uh, first five books of the Bible, it said in the Talmud, it would be better to burn the Torah than to teach a woman. Jesus taught women. Jesus lifts the dignity and status of women in the New Testament. And furthermore, in a Roman court or a Jewish court, the testimony of women was inadmissible evidence. They could not testify because they were considered unreliable and even liars. Not that that was true, you understand. This was their status in the ancient world. Now here's the question. If you were going to fabricate a story, a legend, a lie, 
The one thing you would not do is put into that legend people that nobody believed. Unless, of course, it's absolutely true. What motivation did Luke have? What motivation did any of the gospel writers have to put women as witnesses? None. It would have destroyed the reliability. It would have destroyed the credibility. Not because women were actually unreliable. That was the entire mindset of the ancient world. And here they're the first ones on the scene. Because it's true. And here we are over 2,000 years later. Next we find Cleopas and the unnamed disciple. Then the eleven. And then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, there were 500 people, then James, then Paul. And of course, that's not necessarily order. Jesus made many different appearings, uh, and many saw the empty tomb over that 40-day period. 500 people at one time, Paul would say. Now, Paul wrote that some 20-plus years after the resurrection. Some had died, but many were still alive. Now imagine 500 people available to you for 20 years. Some died off. What's Paul saying? Go ask them. Verifiable. Proven. Why does he say Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joanna with the rest of the women? Go ask them. Why does he name Cleopas? Go ask him. Imagine that many witnesses for 20 years. Any journalist that wanted to investigate. The resurrection, they just had to go ask multiple people. And they would have gotten the same story again and again and again. I saw him. Were they hallucinating? Could that many people hallucinate the same exact vision? No. Nor were they lying, beloved. God has given a strong testimony from eyewitness accounts. Then there's Paul, then there's expert witness. You know, in our day's culture, whenever you want to really nail a case, you bring in a medical expert expert or forensic expert. Well, they bring in a death expert. Matthew tells us the Roman centurion, when Pilate asked, when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to get the body, they said, is he dead? He's dead. Now, when a centurion said a man was dead on the cross because he was an expert in death, And that's why he didn't break the legs of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of prophecy, Psalm 22, and because he was dead. So death expert comes into the courtroom and says, Oh no, I guarantee you, he was dead. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And then there's the martyrs. Many of the apostles were martyrs. Now it's true. Men have taken their own lives for a lie that they believed was true. But tell me, who will give themselves in death for a lie that they know is a lie? No one. Unless, of course, something is not right in their thinking. If the apostles made this story up, fabricated it, and lied, and passed it down, then they were dying and putting their heads on the chopping block for a lie that they knew were a lie. was a lie. Even Muslims in our day have to admit, and they have in writing, that that was very unlikely for someone to do such a thing. And then, beloved, you have the church for 2,000 years. Is it plausible that a fabricated legend, a lie, could produce such a movement across the planet that has lasted over 2,000 years? I think not. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and we have... Observable, it was observed. Objective, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. What are you going to do with the tomb? You say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. It doesn't matter. What are you going to do with the objective, observable, verifiable, historical, non-religious writings like Josephus said and wrote that Christians believed in the resurrection? It's reality. Now in a culture where Reality is no longer reality. And in the culture of expressive individuals where at the core of your being, the authentic self is what you want to be, not objectively what you really are, then there's going to be an approach to Christianity that says, well, I, I don't like that. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't interest me. So as a church, we need to remember that the resurrection is objective and it has been observed 
and it has been verified, and it is historical, and it's reality. But the second witness that Luke will give us is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself in verse 7. So we have human witnesses, eyewitnesses, and now we have the witness of Scripture saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So we could, we could insert the word must at every point. He must be delivered, he must be crucified, and he must rise the third day. The word must means of necessity. Why must he die? Well, somebody says, well, he must die for sinful man, for which I would disagree. He had no obligation to save you, beloved. God was under no divine necessity to save anyone. If He had left all of us in our condemnation, He would be holy, just, and righteous in doing so. So man is not the object of this divine necessity. God is. And if we trace this necessity back to its spring, its fountain, the wellspring for which salvation flows, we would find it's the necessity of His love. When God decided to love, if we can say it that way, when He decided eternally to love, the reason He decided to love was because that He loved, He wanted to love, He delighted in love, and He willed to love. That's it. That's astounding, isn't it? As soon as we make God's love, the necessity of His love, dependent on us, we're on shaky ground. God's love is not dependent on us. That's like filling out your tax forms and putting down your dependents. You know, I've got this many dependents at home. Oh, and yet God, He's my dependent. Because He loves me because I loved Him first. Wrong. God is not your dependent, beloved. There is nothing outside of His sovereign will, nothing outside of Himself that moved Him to love except His own love. Nothing else. That's a soft pillow to lay your head upon each night. As a songwriter penned those words, Hail sovereign love that first began the scheme to rescue fallen man. Hail matchless, free, eternal grace that gave my soul a hiding place. No, the must is not because of you, beloved. The must is because of the love of God and the love of the Savior who must redeem because it's the necessity of His own free love for you. And that's a must that raised Him right out of the grave. But secondly, this witness, this must is because of Scripture. Now consider what was read in 1 Corinthians 15. And we know that Jesus, when He said these words in Galilee, which the angels referred to when they said, Remember that He spoke these words when He was yet in Galilee. What He was speaking was Scripture about Himself. And Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll turn there. He says there, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Verse 1. Which also you have received and wherein you stand. The word stand there means something that's completed in the past. It's never repeated. That's a perfect tense word. When did you come to the place to stand? In such a way that that never happens again. Well, Paul tells us in Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom also we have access to, by faith, into this grace wherein we stand. Same, same tense there. A completed action. When you were born again and effectually called by the gospel and came to faith in Christ, you were united to Christ, you were justified personally. The blood of Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the foundation of justification, became yours at the time you believed it. 
You are not justified by your faithfulness. You are not justified by your prayer life. You are not justified by your obedience. You are not justified by your works. You're not justified by how much you read the Bible. You're not justified by being good. You are justified by receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Faith is the hand that receives the gold of the gospel and just rest in it. Then Paul says, by which also you are being saved. If you keep in memory or hold fast what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So the faith that receives the goal and justification that's never repeated has an ongoing result. Which is God now is saving you by the same faith or He's making you holy. He's sanctifying you. Being sanctified does not contribute to your right standing before God. It is the fruit of having been justified. Sanctification is not the repetition or the, the continuation of being justified. That's finished. Your sanctification is the fruit that you have a right standing with God. So Paul says if you, if you hold fast to the gold of the gospel, and why does he say that? Because God will hold you fast. We sing that, don't we? He will hold me fast. The perseverance of the saints is nothing more and nothing less than the preserving grace of God that's holding on to you. And the fruit of that holding is what? You hold to the gospel. Even if you've let it go at times, God comes and rescues and holds you fast. Now, at the church at Corinth, some were denying the resurrection. So here's the point that Paul wants to make with those words that we just talked about. Verse 3, Because I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures... All right, what testimony are we talking about? Scripture. In verse 7, when the angel said, The Son of Man must be delivered from the hands of sinful men, crucified, raised again the third day, Paul is going to use almost the same words and say it was according to Scripture. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again from the dead the third day according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures. The resurrection is not something tacked onto the Gospel as something unnecessary. The resurrection is a necessity in order for us to be saved. The law required two things, penalty for lawbreakers, but it demanded righteousness. So two things. We often talk about the substitutionary atonement of Christ, but the resurrection is proof that He lived for us. You see, Jesus didn't just have to die for you. He had to live for you. And He did so. That's why Isaiah 53, 11 says, By His knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for He shall bear their iniquities. Why is knowledge required, required to justify sinners? What has to be known? Well, what does the law require? The law requires that God be loved, that He be treasured, that He be honored, that He be valued for the God that He is, and that neighbor is loved as a fruit of that love. How do you love someone you do not know? So Isaiah 53, 11 is telling us that by His knowledge, that is the knowledge of the coming Messiah, He would so know God supremely as a treasure... He would know every square inch of His eternality. He would know everything to know about God because He is God. And through that knowledge, He would love God so supremely and love His neighbor as Himself that He would justify many. And so the resurrection is God's seal and stamp of Christ's righteousness or that He lived for you. He lived for you. His whole life was for you. Not just His death, from His birth and His ministry and everything He did. He was living righteously on your behalf. And so He died for our sins. He took upon Himself our sin, the wrath of God, and bore the penalty of the law. And now He was rewarded. The reward of the law for righteousness. What's that? To live forever. 
So to be in Christ, beloved, means your own resurrection. It means you will experience the reward of His righteousness because He was raised again from the dead the third day. Now, what are the implications now as we think about the testimony of Scripture? Well, Paul's point is this. If you reject the resurrection, you reject the scriptural gospel. In other words, you just denied the entire Old Testament. Not just a couple of passages. The word is plural. If you reject the scriptural gospel, then your faith, verse 2, is in vain. It's not real. If your faith is in vain, you're not being sanctified because you're not holding on to the gold of the gospel. You've cast it aside. If you've cast it aside, then what of your standing before God? You don't have one. That's a pretty solid argument, isn't it? To reject the gospel, to reject the resurrection, is not to reject part of the gospel. It is to reject the whole gospel and the entire Old Testament revelation about what? Jesus Christ, His coming, His death, and His resurrection. It's those very scriptures and the gospel that's transforming us that we believe about the testimony of Christ. So we see, first of all, the witness of human beings that give us objective, reliable, verifiable, it was observed, reality about the death of Christ, but more importantly, Scripture. The Scripture testified to what Jesus Christ did. So if He didn't do it, you're believing a book of lies. If we deny the resurrection, we deny our own salvation, and we are yet in our sins. But thanks be to God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, what? But Christ is risen. He's risen from the dead. Now with that reality, and with all those witnesses, we now turn to the hopeless road. Why were they hopeless? There's two reasons I call it a hopeless road. First, in verse 17, what Jesus said when He joined these two, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple on the road to Emmaus, and says in verse 16, their eyes were holden that they should not know Him. They were restrained. In Mark 16, it says He appeared in another form. I don't take that to mean a non-human form. It's just maybe He changed His face to look like another man. He didn't have some hoodie on where they couldn't see him. They looked at his face and they could not tell it was him because his form had been transformed. He looked like another man. So their eyes were withholding. And he says, what communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad, gloomy, disappointed? Hopeless. They had lost hope. And they begin to speak to Jesus and say, haven't, haven't you heard all the things that have happened? And then in verse 21 is the next reason I'm calling this a hopeless road. Because they said, but we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. The word trusted is El Pidzo, which is often translated hope. We were hoping. And <laughs> we are sad we are disappointed because what we were hoping He would do, He didn't. That's the hopeless road. Do you ever walk a hopeless road because you've lost sight of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means both now and for your future? Now, Luke, it appears, is using a literary device called dramatic irony. That's where the audience and the reader knows something about what's happening, but the characters don't. Well, clearly, we know that's Jesus. You know, we've got the insight, but they don't know that. And clearly, we know He really was raised from the dead, but they haven't embraced that yet. Now, dramatic irony often leads to humor, and you can see the humor here. Because what they do, they begin to describe the very redemption that they've rejected. And they start to tell Jesus what happened. They said, the chief priests in verse 20 have 
delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified. That's redemption. Then they said in verse 21, beside all this, to top it off, today is the third day since these things happened. Verse 7, the third day he'll rise again. They're describing redemption, and yet they're hopeless. Then they say in verse 22, and furthermore, there are certain women also of our company made us astonished. They went early to the grave and they found not his body. And then on top of that, some of the brothers went and verified exactly what they said. No wonder Jesus said, O fools and slow of heart to believe. So let's pose two questions here. Why were they hopeless when they're describing redemption? And then what does Jesus say to give them hope? Well, you can start to see what their hope was in, what begins to emerge in verse 19, when they say to Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, powerful or mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So Jesus Christ, they had observed, was powerful in deeds or works or actions. What kind of deeds? Oh, He walked on water. He fed 5,000 with just a small amount of bread and fishes. He calmed the seas. He raised a man from the dead. Should have been a clue. He cast out demons. You start to see what their wrong expectation of redemption was. See, the word trusted means expect or confide. And when you confide in someone, you entrust something to someone. What had they entrusted to Jesus? They had entrusted their desires into the powerful hands of Jesus, and that He would deliver upon those desires what they were expecting Him to do with that power. And what was it? Redemption means liberation. They expected Him to liberate them from Roman oppression and liberate them from struggle and poverty right into prosperity and wealth. And beloved, that gospel is still here today. Now we don't have to confine it to prosperity. Just think about in your own life how many times you and I have expected the Messiah. We've delivered something into the Messiah's hands that we want. And we expect Him to use His power, His strength, and His might because He did many mighty deeds to deliver on what we want. And when He doesn't, I find myself walking the hopeless road of sadness, gloom, disappointment, and even depression at times. Because I've lost sight of the redemption that Jesus came to bring. Paul would say again in 1 Corinthians 15, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Why are they so miserable? Because their hope was in this life. It was what they thought Jesus was going to do in this life, rather than the life to come. Do you ever misplace your hope, your expectation... Not that they had the wrong Redeemer. They said we trusted it had been He. He is the Redeemer. We thought He would bring redemption. He brought redemption. But we thought it would be redemption after our own making. And sometimes we fall into that same trap, don't we? We're shocked. We're perplexed. And we're on a hopeless road because we have delivered to Jesus what our expectations are, what we think He should do with His powerful hands. Paul would also say... First Corinthians 15, and he's dealing with a church for which some are rejecting the resurrection. He would say, if, the manner, if after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, which probably means beasts like men in preaching, he was struggling with these men, that was very difficult. He said, if I did that, what does it profit me if the dead don't rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul is using a slogan that was used about life. If in this life all we have is hope, then let us eat, drink, and be merry, 
for tomorrow, it's over. And the question is, how did Paul's view of the gospel and the resurrection transform the way he lived? Did he mean then he stopped eating and drinking? No, he had a new slogan. He just didn't drink and eat too deeply from creation in this world. A lack of hope will mean for you and I, beloved, we will start drinking and eating deeply from creation in this world. And why will we do that? We've lost sight of tomorrow. We've lost sight of the resurrection. We've lost sight of a glorious future and what that will mean when then we will drink deeply and we will eat deeply from the abyss of God's love. But today, we're called on to serve Christ in such a way that by hope, faith is producing love. See, we're to nibble on the world. You know, instead of a 32-ounce big soda, it's just illustration, not condemning you if you like, you know, the kind that's so big it's hard to carry, just get a 6-ounce, right? Instead of going back to the table of creation like five times in one meal, just eat small bites. That's just a spiritual illustration to show that that's what the resurrection had done to Paul. It transformed his daily living because he understood in the future we will be married and death will be over and conquered because Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, some people say it's impossible for a man to be raised from the dead, but the scripture argues just the opposite. It's impossible for that man to be held into the grave. It's impossible. Death can't hold its prey because the wages of sin is death, and that man had no sin. Therefore, death ejected Christ from the tomb just like Jonah was ejected from the whale's belly after three days. And because of that resurrection, we have the bright hope in the future that one day we will drink so deeply, we will eat so deeply, that our souls will be satisfied forever. So beloved, let us remember the resurrection in such a way that we're not drinking too deeply. Sometimes I eat a little too deep and drink a little too much from creation, and probably you do too. But the resurrection transforms us because we understand that the glory is to come. And these disciples thought the glory should be now. It should be now. Paul would say to the church at Colossians to show how hope would transform us into people that love. He would say he prayed for the Colossian church ever since he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love to all the saints because of the hope they had laid up for them in heaven, whereof they had heard in the gospel of the truth of God. Because of the hope, what happened? Hope awakens and sustains faith in trial, in difficulty, and in sadness, and keeps faith walking the pathway of love. Love keeps happening. Why? Because hope is like that player in the huddle. When you're just getting destroyed in the game. And everybody's saying, I'm just too tired, man. This is too tough. It's not worth it. I've got cramps. I'm hurting. And that player says, look at the scoreboard. When that buzzer goes off, we're going to be ushered into heaven forever. And then you're going to see it's worth it all. So the rest of the team in the huddle say, all right, let's go. Let's keep running. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep loving. Because you cannot love without hope. Faith will eventually get sluggish. It will grow cold. It will grow tired and weak. And then what will happen? A loss of hope means faith then shifts back to creation and starts drinking deeply once again. And what happens to love? Love shifts from neighbor back to me. Has that ever happened to you? What's the cure for that? The resurrection. Of Jesus Christ. It's keeping hope and forever in front of us, keeping joy in front of us. The resurrection doesn't eliminate all disappointments and sadness in your life, but what it does, it brings gladness in your sadness. Or as Paul said, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. He was sorrowful, he had disappointments, but as he looked to eternity, 
He had that joy and gladness in front of him because he saw the hope that was laid up for him by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It can be the same for us, beloved. Without hope, eventually, we will grow cold, tired, weak, and we'll let go of the gospel. We'll let it go because we found a gold drinking deeply in this world and we'll let it go. Not only did they have the wrong expectation, they had the wrong means or method of redemption. Powerful Jesus was. Powerful in word and deed. What did they expect him to do? Mount up on a white horse and call everyone that would summons up what? Their own inner strength and power to obey and follow Jesus Christ in their own strength. Throughout the New Testament, we see that's what the Jews thought. That's why Paul wrote to this very church in 1 Corinthians 15, or 1 rather. He would say what? The Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after foolishness. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Scandal, the Greek word scandalon, scandalous. Now what's the sign that the Jews required. Now Jesus gave all kinds of powerful signs, but Paul says we preach a weak Savior. Because Paul said He was crucified in weakness. We preach a Savior that says you've got to abandon your strength, your wisdom, leave it at the, check it in at the door because it will not come into the presence of God. And what do the Jews want? A sign that would affirm the strength of their own self-righteousness. Because they were going about to establish their own righteousness. And if you're going to establish your own righteousness, are you going to follow a man that was crucified and looks weak and says, you don't have any righteousness? No, that's going to be a stumbling block to you. If your thing is wisdom, and you follow a man that says, look, I want you to use all your wisdom, all your ability to decide, all your intellect to follow me, you say, okay, I'm all in. But if he says, it will not be your wisdom at all, you would say as a natural man, that's foolish. And that's what the Greeks said. But in them which are called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, the cross destroys boasting in ourselves and gives all the boasting to God. Because of God are you in Christ Jesus who's made unto us our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. As it is written, for this reason, let them that glory, glory in the Lord. So they had the wrong expectation, that's why they're hopeless. And they had the wrong view of the method of redemption. We hoped it had been Him, but He's dead. Obviously, He's not the Redeemer because He died. And it was through that very death, through that weakness, that He was raised again with power. Power. Now, how did Jesus give them hope? Verse 25, O fools of slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? See, the pattern of Scripture is the pattern of Christ. First we suffer, glory to come. What did they want? Glory now? Get rid of the suffering. Now that's what you want too down deep. And it's what I want too. But Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall come. So the the pattern of the Redeemer is our pattern. Suffering now, trial, struggle, glory to come. That's why they didn't believe. So Jesus does what? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. And then we know then in verse 32, they said one to another, Jesus made Himself known, did not our hearts burn within us? While He talked with us, by the way, and while He opened to us the Scriptures. Burn just means to be moved. They were moved intellectually, mentally, and they were moved emotionally. Now, what moved them? Well, Jesus said, hey, it's me. That's not what moved them. They didn't know it was Him. They were moved prior to knowing it was Jesus. What moved them was Scripture. It was Scripture. It wasn't that Jesus spoke in an eloquent way. Certainly, to hear His voice would have been wonderful. But since Isaiah 53 says there's no form nor comeliness that we should desire Him, maybe His voice was kind of scratchy and not really that special. 
His appearance wasn't. You say, oh, if I could just see Jesus. You have. If your heart is to burn and to be moved mentally and emotionally, it's going to be burned by Scripture. And that's what Jesus does. He expounds. He just simply explains all the Scriptures concerning Himself. He uses the word all three times. All the prophets, all the prophets, all the Scriptures. Which I don't take to mean He went to every single Scripture in the Old Testament. He went multiple through Moses and prophets concerning Himself. Which means they probably had a selective approach to Scripture. They were looking for the redemption text that would affirm their hopes. That's why they're walking on a hopeless road. Beloved, let us not come to the Bible selectively, looking for what we want it to say, looking for what we hope it will say. Let us read the Scripture, looking for God, looking for the Son of God, looking for the will of God, looking for obedience to God. And it will keep us from walking a hopeless road. And then finally, the fearful room. We know that they're fearful because John tells us that, even though Luke doesn't record that. And Jesus says these words then. In verse 44, He said, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Why? Because they were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms, the three divisions of the Old Testament, concerning Me. Then He opened their understanding that they might understand what? The Scriptures. Verse 46. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now how can a fearful group of apostles take a message that people are going to hate when they're afraid, something's got to transform them. Now, one of the things will be in verse uh, 49 is when He sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be the empowerment to overcome fear. But it's going to be the empowerment of what? Scripture that's going to overcome that fear. And beloved, our fears can be overcome by Scripture as well. Do you ever get afraid? Are you ever afraid of the future? Afraid of what might happen? Anxious, worried, gripped with fear. Well, we're, we're in company with the apostles. They locked the door. They didn't want any of it. They were afraid. And Jesus comes and says, hey, you're, you're the guys I've chosen. I, I know. Maybe I should have picked somebody else. But hey, you fearful guys, you're going to take this message to the nations. Beloved, the resurrection is a message for the world, for the nations. It's a message deposited into the apostles' hands, written to the church. It's a message for the church today to take the gospel to the nations. How can we do this in a culture that is so antagonistic, angry, you don't know what might happen? You share the gospel. We see what happened in such a culture that hates God in such a way that they, they martyr Christians, persecute Christians. What does Jesus say that's going to transform them? Before I say that, I want to give you a couple, couple of things about the resurrection here that gives us confidence and removes some fear. First of all, the, the resurrection is personal. Jesus says, look, it's my hands and my feet. Your hands and your feet and your body are going to be resurrected. It's going to be you. But you're going to be glorified. Paul said your body is sown in incorruption. It will be raised uh, corruption. It will be raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. Raised in glory. Honor. It's sown not only in dishonor. Let me get it. Weakness. Sown in weakness, raised in power. The word power means inherent power. Some way, your glorified body is going to have inherent power. 
The only place we see a glorified body in Scripture is Jesus' body. And what does He do? In verse 31 of Luke 24, He vanishes. He eats and He appears. There will be some kind of inherent power that we have that will equip us, not only for the enjoyment of God, both soul and body, but equip us for the economy of heaven. Whatever that is. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be unimaginably wonderful. But until then, we need courage. And what is this courage? Well, Jesus calls Himself the Anointed, the Christ. He interchanges the word I, personal pronoun, with the Christ. And the Christ means anointed. Now, if you go back to Psalm 2, this is mentioned throughout the Scriptures, He would say, the three divisions of the Old Testament. In Psalm 2, verse 2, the writer there concerning this Christ would say, The kings of the earth set themselves together. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against His Christ, Messias or Messiah. You remember in Acts 4.26, when the church quotes that psalm, they say the kings of the earth stood up against the Lord and against His Christ. Anointed? New Testament says, that's the Christ. Jesus says, that's me. But in Psalm 2.6, this is what God says in response to the crucifixion. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you. To kiss a king's ring is symbolic of loyalty and submission. Beloved, The way Jesus dispels their fears, He said, I am the true King. And in Matthew 28, 18, same commission. Go therefore. All power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. He's the exalted King. He's the true King. He's the King of the universe. Go on the basis that I am your King. I will be with you to the end of the age or the end of the world. There's not a sparrow that falls to the ground without your king. There's not a king that's set up on earth or put down without your king. There's not a hair on your head that will perish without your king. No one will harm you without your king. No one will touch you if the king wills it. And if something does touch you, the king says, I'm going to make that serve your good. This band of fearful men locked up in a room were transformed by the reality that the crucified Christ is a risen king. And there's the rub, isn't it? See, when you try to tell someone about this resurrected king, what's the problem? They don't want to serve a king. The reality is you're serving a king right now. It's either King Jesus or it's the king of your own making. No one does not serve a king. You're either the king of your own life, the king of your own throne. You make your own decisions. You do your own will. You see life your way and you go for it. Then you're the king. And you'll have to answer to the king. But for all those that bow down to the supremacy of this king and submit, not in order to be right, because this king's resurrection has made you right, out of that life is a life of submission, love, commitment, and joy in the risen king. Have you... Submitted yourself to this king. You see, here's where we come to the, to the objectivity that you've got to deal with in the empty tomb. You say, I don't like that. I don't want to bow down. He's risen, beloved. He's king. And God has given assurance to all men. He's given confidence to every man that wants to look at the record and that he's risen from the dead. And he's going to judge all men by that man which he has ordained. And he'll do it righteously. So what will you do with King Jesus? What will you do with the empty tomb? Will you keep walking a hopeless road? Will you keep letting fear paralyze us? And you? Or will you bow in submission to a loving, powerful, wonderful King who's going to take you right into glory? May you do that today. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We are amazed and marvel at your grace and the love of Jesus who took upon the form of a servant, gave Himself, lived His life for us, and gave His life for us. He poured out His soul unto death, not just His body, His soul. 
He loved us to the end, John would tell us. And in that love, that love held him on the cross until redemption was accomplished. And now, the son of your love, in whom you've well pleased, you have set upon the throne of your right hand, ruling and reigning over all things for the church. And Lord, we agree, we trust, we put confidence in King Jesus. And Lord, we ask you, help us in our times of being on the hopeless road. Help us, Lord, in our times of being gripped with fear because we still have fears. Help us, Lord, to remember in those times and look back and to remember there's an empty tomb. He is risen. Just as he said, he's gone into heavens and seated at your right hand. And may this be our hope that will make us steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, because of your resurrection, our labor is not in vain in you. Make this a reality, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.